Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this Father's Day, Lord. We thank you for my first Father's Day, Lord. I give you glory and praise and honor for that. Mm -hmm. But Lord, we thank you that you are such an awesome Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would give your one and only Son, Lord, that we could live. We pray now that you would use Pastor Izzy to to speak to each one of us using your word, Lord, that uh, you set before us, Lord, to encourage us, to um, let us know who you are and how much you love us. And Lord, we pray now that you'd send the Holy Spirit, Lord, just like that breeze is blowing in off the ocean, Lord, that you would fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we are people that need help, and you are the one to help us. So we ask that now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, guys, we get to pick up today where we left off last week in 1 Corinthians 15, where we're coming to the one verse 8 tells us was the untimely born one. Anyone might that knows this chapter knows who he's talking about when Paul refers to the, the one who was untimely born. He says that Christ, now he just, for those of you who weren't with us, Paul's been telling the, Corinth, the church at Corinth the most important thing about our faith is three things that were taught according to the scripture. And it's found in verse 3 if you want to look at it. He said, I deliver to you of first importance that, uh, he says, which I have received also. And Paul says he received this. Now, uh, later I'm going to ask you, when did he receive this? Paul the Apostle says he delivers what he has received. And so he received this also, he says, and he, he received that Christ first died for our sins, according to the Scripture, then that Christ was buried, according to the scriptures. And what's the third thing? He rose, right? The resurrection. And then he appeared, it says first to Cephas, or to the twelve, then Cephas, uh, Peter, then to the twelve again, and to, to more than 500. He also appeared to James, the apostle. So Paul then says, now last of all, his Christ appearance of him resurrected from the dead He says, lastly, he appeared to one that was untimely born. And he said, that one would be who? Paul says, me also. Christ also appeared to me resurrected. And so it says in verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles. Paul Paul refers to himself, he he says, I'm not even fit to be called an apostle. And he tells us why. He says, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, he said, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, he says, did the labor, but the grace of God. For he says, by the, but the grace of God was with me. The grace of God with us. He says, whether then it was I or it was they, so whoever it was, we preach and so you have believed. Paul didn't really... You know, he wasn't hung up on himself. If he was the vessel that brought the, brought the message, if Peter brought the message, if James brought the message, he didn't, he is like, it's not about us. He says, we didn't die for you. Christ died for you. So whoever preaches the message, don't ever, don't elevate the preacher. Elevate the message. The message is what's important, right? You, you shouldn't walk away from a church going, that preacher was the great thing. That, oh, he was the greatest thing. That's not what it's about. The preacher, the, the preacher is not what it's about. What it's about is about the message of Christ, right? That Christ died for our sins, that Christ was buried, that he rose from the dead. That's a biggie. And that is the biggie because without it, we're going to go on next week and see Paul's going to say, Without the resurrection from the dead, this whole, this whole story unravels. It's no good. It has no power. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then the promise of our resurrection is in the toilet, right? I mean, if he didn't rise, we don't stand a chance. But he did rise. And because he rose from the dead, we have the promise of our resurrection. And so Paul says, last of all, least... 
I got called by the grace of God. And he says, I am what I am. Now, I think if all believers would just embrace this as a motto that we lived by, you know, literally when people say, oh, you're, you've got it together, Tim. You got, you know, you're such a good mechanic and you can do all this. And you go, look, I am what I am by what? The grace of God. I mean, if we, if we presented to others, we are what we are. We're at the place in life where we are. We have what we have by the grace of God. Not, if you think about it, it's not really because a lot of the stuff what we've been entrusted with in this life, most of us didn't do anything to get it. You know, it was given to us by God. I mean, we, how many determined what color hair you got, except for you that are using a bottle and bleaching it or whatever, but I mean, <laughs> I'm talking what you were born with, you know, or your looks, you know, most of the packaging, I call it, that we came in, we had nothing to do with this package. I mean, we might work on it really hard to try to keep it from sagging, keep it from going the way of the earth, but, but a lot of it's genetics, I mean, I meet some folks and I'm like, I've been working out really hard trying to get some muscles. And, and you meet this guy and he's like, got bulging muscles everywhere. And he's like, I don't even lift weights. It's all genetics. You know, you're like, oh. But that's how it is. A lot of the traits, what we have, the color of our eyes, the, the, some of the God-given gifts of what we have, we didn't do anything to get them. Our parents, the genetics, passed it on to us. And it was a God-given life gift. What we are, we should just say, well, I am what I am by the grace of God. Now, Paul says he was least of the apostles. Yet the work that he did, did he consider the work that, you know, God, well, that he says God did through him by his grace, was the work that Paul, the, measure the work what Paul the Apostle did in the early church, say, to one of the other apostles. How about Matthew? Do we have much record of Matthew doing, planting a bunch of churches, going on missions, sharing the gospel, leading thousands to Christ? No. How about Mark? Yeah, he went with, with um, John Mark went with, but he wasn't in the apostles' group. He's just one of the writers that went along with the apostles, so he doesn't count. John, yes, John did get used mightily. But you know, if you think about it, John wrote how many books in the in the in the scripture? The Gospel of John, First John, Second John, Third John, right? And the Lord used him to pen one more book. Which one? Revelation. Revelation. Five. How many books are attributed to Paul the Apostle in the New Testament? Anyone know? We have 27 books total. We have 12 for certain that are penned by the hand of Paul the Apostle. And um, 13, if you, so a lot of guys interject because we're not told who penned the book of Hebrews. But if you look at the style of writing, it's almost like a collaboration between Luke and Paul. It kind of has a lot of the same characteristics of both their writing. And it's, and it's a good chance they actually, you know, worked together and wrote that that letter but uh, either way how many of you would like to write I mean 12 13 wait, I'm sorry no it's 13 that Paul has 14 would be Hebrew so so he has could be nearly half or or if it's 14 it's over half the books of the New Testament anyone here can say you wrote half the New Testament I mean you talk about like a pretty big you know what what do you go down for in history of of, um, you know, that you, that you were used of the Lord. Uh, not much. I planted a bunch of churches and wrote half the New Testament. Now, <laughs> you say, wow, what kind of dude was this, man? He, he must have been something special. I told you last week, if you have time, please read Acts chapter 9 for me. Because Paul said in summing up right here to the church at Corinth, and they, guys, remember, he pastored that church. He planted that work and pastored there for a year and a half. Now he's left on continued his missionary journey and is writing back to them about questions they had. And he mentions to them, you know, guys, I, I'm like the last in the lineup that Christ, I mean, Christ appeared to me least of all. I'm like, not, he didn't have an overinflated, you know, s head when, he, when it came to the spiritual thing. He's like, I, I'm least. Yet, the work God did through me 
was mighty. It wasn't least because I had his grace. If we just understood how much his grace could do in our lives, by the grace of God that we would be who we are by his grace, and the things God would like to do through us, through his grace, are mighty. Let me show you the background to this man who, who just kind of, I call it Reader's Digest, skims over his testimony. In, in Corinthians here, verse 9, he said, I'm the least, I'm not fit to be called an apostle because one thing. What did he say? Because I persecuted the church of God. This guy who got used to write almost half or maybe over half of the New Testament was a persecutor of Christians. He was a persecutor of the church of God. And we find his testimony recorded for us in the, in the book of Acts, chapter 9, where Luke carefully did some investigation about this guy. And this is really great. This is the one... I've been, I've been waiting to do this part for you because I think if you could wrap your head around today the, the very choice what God chose to use in a mighty, mighty way for his kingdom is probably, I'm going to submit to you before I even read you the story, that this guy, if we were picking teams for God, you know, we're going to get some strong superstars to serve the Lord. I submit to you, not very many of you would pick him to be on the team. And I'm going to show you that even back then, the early church wasn't going to pick him. They didn't even want him on the team. And some of you know why, because you've read this. But for those that are, are, are new to this, let me read to you from Acts chapter 9. We, we, we read the historic account of the conversion of Saul. Now, before Paul was called Paul the Apostle, he was called Saul. And I've told you this before, but Saul in Hebrew, nice name. It's, um, it means handsome, desirable. It's, um, it's the Hebrew equivalent to GQ. For men, you know, like, I mean, they got, you know, words for the women that are beautiful. This is like the word, the, the, the real complimentary word of handsome or desirable, you know, really hot stuff in, in man form, okay? This is, it's a masculine, they, they have masculine and feminine in, in Hebrew also. So I grew up in speaking Italian, it's the same. But this is the masculine form of saying hot stuff, you know, good looking, desirable. So Saul, Mr. Hot Stuff, we read about him. It says, now Saul was still breathing threats. Look at verse 1 of Acts chapter 9. And murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest and he asked for letters from, for, from him to, to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found anyone belonging to the way, he, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And he was traveling, and it happened that as he was approaching Damascus, that suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. Now it says the men that were traveling with him, verse 7, stood speechless. They were hearing the voice, but they weren't seeing anyone. Can Jesus appear to just one person and the other people around him not see the Lord? I mean, have you ever thought about this? How hard is this for, for, for the Son of God? Nothing. I mean, it's like... But interestingly enough, though they couldn't see the Lord, they still heard his voice. I find this really cool. I mean, how God can be revealing himself to someone. One person is seeing the Lord, hearing the Lord, and other people are right next to him, and they only hear the Lord. Or maybe, and this happens even at our church, one person is totally hearing the Lord speak to them, and the person next to them going, I don't get anything. I wish this pastor would get on with it. What's the point? You know, and they're hearing nothing. And you think, you know, I know because as, serving the Lord, one of the aunties asked me, how long have you been, been preaching? And, um, well, I got the privilege to start off when I was about 17. I'm 54. You do the math. It's enough years. And, you know, when you, when you share the word, 
those of you are good at math, 37 years. So you've been doing this for a while. It's not my first day. I think, she goes, you're really, I, I like your voice, and I like the way you explain the things, and I get so much out of it. And I thought, oh, thank you. And I have to chuckle inside because I remember a day when someone came up, and the guy goes, I didn't get anything out of that. That was the worst message ever. I mean, that just sucked. What a waste of time. And he told me this. And I was like, wow, awesome. That just really hit hard, you know? And the very, the, the, now listen, this is what I did tell you. Right before he came up, an auntie had come up and hugged me and said, thank you so much for listening to the Lord. It's, you were like a, 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 a conduit that he was just speaking straight to me. I needed that so much. And, I, you know, I, I went from on this high of, wow, praise the Lord. I got to be, you know, used by the Lord just as a, a vessel for him to speak through. That's what you always want to do as a pastor. You want to be the one that the Lord just puts the words in your mouth, not your words. His words just come falling from your lips. And they go to the ears of the ones that need it. And they're going, yeah, thank you, Lord. I needed to hear that. That's what I, I was asking you for that answer. And I got it. You know, they're all psyched. I had just come from that beautiful hug and, oh, man, that spoke to me to this guy. I didn't get a stinking thing out of it. That was, uh, I don't need it. And I was like, Lord? And then right after he walked away, another auntie who heard him said, no, no, you were, the Holy Spirit was speaking through you mightily. And the Lord goes, just, just right then, you know that little voice when the Lord tells you something? He reminded me that at the end of every sermon, Jesus used to say, let him who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. You know, some people, they don't have an ear to hear what God wants to speak to them. You can have the great message, but if their ear doesn't, you know, want to, they're not going, hey, Lord, I, I want to hear. Okay, now this time you can film them. They really want to come to service. You can leave that in for the for the YouTube anyway. Church on the beach. Gliders included. <laughs> so so the reality is is that this story here what talks about Paul's conversion is he's he he is seeing the Lord, he's hearing the Lord, but his buddies that were traveling, his traveling companions, they only heard the voice. They didn't see him. Now, some of you know what happened. What happened to Paul's eyesight from this seeing the Lord? I mean, how bright was his appearance? Anyone remember here? Blinding. Yeah, it was brighter, it says, than the light at, 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 at high noon. He, here he is, this bright, this lightning. I mean, a light from heaven that flashed. It, it blinded him. Look at this. Verse 8 says, Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open... He could see nothing. He saw something spiritual. He saw the Lord. But, man, you talk about a, an experience. Seeing the Lord in his glory did a number on his eyes. He couldn't see a thing. His eyes were open and he was blind. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. It says him, he was there three days without sight. This isn't one of those, you looked at the sun and then you looked away and you see the little spot, you know. And you're kind of blinded in one spot. He is blind from the brightness of the Lord for three days. He can't see. You think, oh, fried his retina or something. I don't know. But this is where the story gets interesting. The testimony of this man who was, he was breathing threats to go arrest and, and imprison and beat anyone that claimed to belong to this, this thing called the way. That's what they called the early church, by the way. The way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets the Father except through me. I mean, it was that simple. So the early church said, what's it called? The way. The way to what? The way to God. Jesus is the way. That's all it's about. Jesus. And so they said, they said, um, the, the, he, Paul, he was there three days, three nights without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. And there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, he said, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. By the way, if the Lord calls your name, what are you going to say? Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. 
Like, I mean, if the Lord calls your name, just go, I'm here. It's a way, in, in their culture, when you said, here I am, you were presenting yourself as, um, in Italian, we say, we, we, when we pick up the phone, to answer the phone, we say pronto means ready. We don't say hello, we say pronto, you know, like um, I'm ready. I, I presented myself like I'm ready, speak. What you're going to, you know, now I, I'm ready to hear what you have to say. It's like that same idea in Hebrew when they say here I am. You're, it, it's um, it, it literally, if you know Italian, it is the equivalent of the Hebrew word here is the equivalent in Italian of pronto. He's literally saying ready. I, here I am, like, I'm here, ready, speak. That's all he's doing. The Lord calls his name and he's like, yes, I'm ready. Go ahead. What, what do you want to say? If the Lord calls your name, what are you going to do? I hope you say, hey, okay, yes, you call me? Yes, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to hear. Speak, go ahead. I mean, are you going to do, are you going to go, oh, what was that? Oh, I think the Lord was trying to speak to me. But hey, by the way, some people do this too. The Lord's going, excuse me, I'm calling you. And they're like, like it's a fly. Get away. Get. I think something's trying to talk to me. But I don't, you know. The good Lord could be trying to talk to them. And they don't, they don't present themselves ready to hear. But when Ananias, this disciple of the Lord there in Damascus, heard the Lord call his name, he went, here I am. Ready, go ahead. And the Lord spoke to him. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.